<coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our February public lecture. Sin, business ethics, and the Lebanese Thaura, what the church can say now. This is one of the very few titles of lectures at NEST that I feel uh, needs no introduction, no justification. It's the topic of the hour. It's what everybody is thinking and talking and actually demonstrating about. And from our perspective as a theological seminary, of course, we are definitely interested additionally about the place or the viewpoint of the church, of what Christians can say. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Professor Harry Van Buren. Harry Van Buren is a visiting professor of business ethics at the Ulayan School of Business at the American University of Beirut and is on leave from the University of New Mexico's Anderson School of Management, where he holds the Rust Professorship in Business Ethics. His doctorate in Business Environment, Ethics, and Public Policy is from the University of Pittsburgh's Katz Graduate School of Business, and he also earned a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. So a solid background in theology and an expertise in business and business ethics, a rare combination. His current research interests include relational stakeholder theory, business and human rights, preventing human trafficking in global supply chains, employment ethics, gender and social capital, and intersectionality analysis in diversity management. Professor Van Buren has numerous publications in many journals and periodicals. He is currently the president of the International Association for Business and Society and a former division chair for the Social Issues in Management Division of the, of the Academy of Management. He is the Religion, Spirituality and Business Ethics section editor for the Journal of Business Ethics. He has just been named, and so he is moving from New Mexico, he's been named the Koch, Coach Endowed Chair in Business Ethics at the Opus College of Business, University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Harry Van Buren. Thank you much, very much, uh, Dr. Sabra, for your uh, kind introduction. And thank you for everybody for uh, coming to this particular uh, lecture, which a big part of any sort of lecture or any sort of academic writing is coming up with a title. Uh, and so I worked really hard on this uh, title to throw in as many words as I can to try to attract an audience. And so I think I was uh, successful in uh, that uh, regard. On October 17th, 2019, I was on my way uh, to a conference in Vail, Colorado, when a story alert from Lebanon's English language newspaper, The Daily Star, came across my phone. The story was about a proposed 20 cent per day tax on voice over internet protocol uh, phone calls using such popular and free services like WhatsApp. In a country with extremely high mobile telephone rates relative to other countries, in which the minimum wage at the time was the equivalent of $450 per month, such a tax would have been highly regressive and costly. Upon receiving the alert, I sent one of my colleagues this message via WhatsApp, of course, because that's how everybody in Lebanon communicates, and this was the message. Taxing WhatsApp, the only thing that could have been worse is taxing family gatherings, which taxing WhatsApp is, really. Now, on my way to the conference, I put my phone away and I continued on my journey, thinking this was, be, was fated to be yet another episode of poorly thought through public policy in Lebanon, soon to be forgotten. Of course, it wasn't to be soon forgotten, as we all know. I spent that entire weekend monitoring events and not paying attention during my conference, chatting via WhatsApp with my colleagues at the American University of Beirut, making sure my wife was safe, and trying to figure out how all this was going to unfold in Lebanon and what would happen next. The WhatsApp tax, although very quickly withdrawn, 
generated, as we all know in this room, mass protests in the streets. The Lebanese Thaura, a revolution against corruption, economic stagnation, and rising levels of inequality had begun. Early in the protest, there was a lot of hope and optimism, as the millions of people in the streets, and you see some of them here, up to 40% of the population, by some estimates, felt like this was finally the beginning of a new dawn for the country and its long-suffering citizens. <clears throat> as we all know now, hope gave way to anger and frustration, as one prime minister resigned and another, after a long delay and massive political infighting, took his place. As inflation began to increase, as working hours and incomes for many Lebanese began to fall and then slide precipitously, and as day upon day brought not only no real change toward a just political and economic order, but a sense that the political establishment was actively going out of its way to disregard the protesters' demands. It is not surprising, therefore, that the optimistic tone of the early protests has largely dissipated. To be replaced by angrier protests in the streets, many of which have targeted businesses such as banks. Now how can we explain why the protests started and why they have continued for as long as they have? One answer might be the high level of inequality in Lebanon relative to other countries, which in my judgment made the protests not only likely, but indeed inevitable. slide did not uh, make it uh, into the uh, presentation. So the slide that I would have uh, put up uh, was a slide about uh, different shares of national income for the uh, richest 1% of the population. In the European Union, the figure is about uh, 10%. In the United States, the figure is about 25%. And in Lebanon, about 25% of national income is controlled by the richest 1% of the population. And I use this slide to talk about the current situation in Lebanon. It has such a high level of inequality, and think about that just for a moment. 1% of the Lebanese population gets nearly a quarter percent of national income. But it's not just income inequality that contributed to a climate in which the Thara took hold. Every day, people in Lebanon suffer from various harms brought about not only by inadequate and inept public policy, but also unethical business behavior, which is, of course is my specialty. Early in the protest, the New York Times published this article. And the article is entitled, To Make Sense of Lebanon's Protests, Follow the Garbage. Now again, for this audience, and I hear the knowing laughter uh, from uh, people, Lebanon has a perpetual garbage crisis. When I visited Beirut uh, in AUB in October of 2017, I was shocked at the amount of garbage to be found everywhere, on the corniche, in empty lots, and pretty much everywhere except in places where it could be disposed of safely. Of course, the garbage crisis affects people in lots of ways, including a persistent stench over some of Beirut during the summer. The New York Times article detailed allegations that are all too familiar to people in Lebanon. Lucrative waste management contracts doled out to politically connected businesses that inflated invoices while failing to both sort out recyclables and to remove hazardous materials, and as a result, quote, garbage and the toxic liquid oozing from it were going straight into the sea. At the beginning of the article, it laid out the key issues quite succinctly in, in a way that has real resonance for the things I'm going to talk about during this lecture. Quote, in Lebanon, it's people like to boast. You can take in pristine mountain villages and swim in the shimmering sea all in one day. But the country's blonde sand beaches are now scarred with plastic bottles and its mountain streams befouled by open dumps. The Mediterranean gurgles with toxic runoff from rotting garbage. A seemingly unstoppable proliferation of trash has marred Lebanon's water, seafood, and public health. The government's inability to provide basic services, including 24-hour electricity and garbage collection, 
is rooted in an agreement that ended Lebanon's civil war nearly 30 years ago. The deal divided power between the nation's 18 recognized religious sects, effectively institutionalizing corruption, with each group able to dole out government favor, jobs, contracts, favors, and social services to its followers. The Lebanese have finally had enough of a system that has enriched the political elite while failing to build a stable economy or provide basics like re reliable running water or consistent waste management." End quote. Indeed, Lebanon is an economy in which people pay twice for many essential services. Once for municipal water bills and again for safe drinking water, once for electricity from the state-run utility and again for generators that provide power during the extensive periods in which the utility does not generate enough power for 24-hour service. When the Lebanese were asked to pay twice again, once for mobile data services allowing them to communicate with family and friends for free, and again to make a phone free phone call using those same services, it is not surprising that they began protesting and continue to protest. And of course, I don't have to tell this audience, banks that are failing to allow depositors free access to their US dollar accounts are also the target of protesters. According to Transparency International, Lebanon is the 138th most corrupt country in the world. As a business ethicist, I have long been interested in the ways in which business behavior can bring about genuinely shared prosperity for the many or disproportionate wealth for the well-connected few. It should not be surprising that many of the world's wealthiest countries combine low levels of corruption and low levels of income inequality. Quite obviously, Lebanon is the opposite. And that is why the protests that started on October 17th have continued for the last 119 days and counting. It's obvious that the Lebanese economy is not working for many of its citizens, much less the Palestinian and Syrian refugees currently living in the country. I want to argue today that this is not just a failure of government and public policy, but of business ethics as well. Today, I will focus on the role that business can and should play in creating a prosperous and just society, why greed gets in the way of that happening, and the role that churches can and should take on to speak to the present moment. So in this lecture, I will first provide an overview of the business ethics field that I'm a part of and the relevance of business ethics to Lebanon. I will then discuss why theological ideas such as sin are important for work in business ethics, noting that these ideas represent a deep source of wisdom that is essential for addressing the problem of unethical business behavior, while also offering a vision for what business could be. I will then consider the sin of greed and its application to business ethics, and move from there to an analysis of what religious institutions have to contribute to discussions about business ethics. I will conclude by offering principles for Christian institutions in Lebanon seeking to influence business behavior. Now, I've been working in the field of business ethics for more than 25 years. First as a staff member for the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility in New York City, then as a doctoral student in business ethics, and then as a professor and researcher in the field. Now, when you work in the field of business ethics, you hear a lot of jokes, and believe me, I have heard them all. Business ethics, that must be a short course. Is a textbook written on a postcard? <laughs> business ethics, now that's an oxymoron. Seriously, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I would be able to retire, particularly if those dollars were held outside of Lebanon. And is this a theoretical subject? And look, I get why people tell the jokes but there's a serious point behind them. Business does seem to act unethically in many cases. The sentiment expressed in this cartoon, in which a group of children are told that, quote, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders, I think represents a lot of people's thinking about business. But more to the point, I think these jokes about business ethics get at some people's personal experiences with businesses as employees, as consumers, and as community members.
Now, if you have had your pay cut, as many people in, in the United States have, or if you've lived, lived next to a polluting facility, or if you've seen CEOs earn an awful lot of money that hasn't been taxed, you're sympathetic to the point of view that much of business lacks ethics. But of course, business ethics does matter. Business ethics matters because business matters for society. As an academic field, business ethics has existed for about 50 years, but as long as there has been business, there have been concerns about ethical behavior in business. The field of business ethics as we know it today comes out of various social movements in the 1960s and 70s that sought to respond to the perceived excesses of businesses, such as the civil rights movement seeking equality for racial minorities and the feminist movement seeking the same for women. The consumer movement pushing companies to respect the rights of consumers while providing real value to consumers and the environmental movement that addressed pollution and its effects on people and the planet. Business ethics as a field seeks to develop frameworks for assessing whether business practices are ethical as well as whether businesses are creating benefits for their stakeholders and for society. At Syracuse University, I took the very first course in business ethics that that institution offered in 1989 and I'm in the second generation of people who receive doctorates in the subject. So business ethics is a new field, certainly relative to theology, but it addresses concerns that are as old as business itself. And today, there's a number of different topics that are within the domain of business ethics. For example, you have the field of business eth or behavioral ethics in ethical leadership. And this field uses insights from psychology and sociology and anthropology to understand why people behave ethically in business and why it is that good people, many of the people who work in businesses, nevertheless do bad things inside of organizations. There's a field of business government relations, which addresses the extent to which business behavior is constrained or not constrained by government and in turn, how business can influence government regulation. Business and community relations addresses whether businesses create value for communities or whether those businesses extract value and inflict costs upon them. My main field these days is the field of business and human rights, which is a growing field that recognizes the complicity of businesses in human rights violations. And then you have other fields within the discipline such as environmental responsibility and sustainability, which has made enormous progress in some domains in improving the environmental performance of companies, equitable treatment of employees and consumers. A growing field is the ethical implications of the use and indeed misuse of technology, which includes everything from consumer and employee privacy to the many unintended side effects of technology ethical practices in specific industries, everything from the baby milk campaigns of the 1960s to campaigns against uh, banks that we see today and all sorts of industries in between, marketing ethics and supplier relationships, which are a place in which businesses have considerable scope to act unethically. Ultimately, the work that is done in business ethics seeks to interrogate business practices to ask hard questions about the extent to which those practices are just or unjust, and ultimately to find ways to make businesses better. So why is business ethics relevant to Lebanon? Well, I think that's an obvious question, but uh, for the sake of the uh, lecture, I will give you at least my thoughts on the uh, subject. I think, first of all, business ethics is relevant to Lebanon because it's relevant everywhere. To me, business is truly the essential social institution. I remember when uh, my wife and I uh, were graduating from seminary and I was thinking about what kind of doctorate I wanted to get after seminary. I thought about briefly getting a PhD in religious ethics and then I realized that if I wanted to make the world a better place, business was in some sense the real locus to do that because business has enormous implications and effects on every single one of us. We can't live without business because we want stuff that we can't produce on our own, 
If we didn't have business, we would have to create it. So in some sense, the questions about business ethics are similar in, sim in different places. So much of what I would say here, I would say to an audience in Western Europe or in the United States or in Australia. However, I want to argue that the Lebanese context is different for three reasons. The first is that government ineffectiveness and corruption gives businesses a lot more freedom to behave ethically or unethically in Lebanon than in other places where there is effective government regulation. I often tell my students that just because a business can behave in a particular way doesn't mean that it should. And I noted previously in the lecture that according to Transparency International, Lebanon is the 138th most corrupt country in the world. As one of my students asked, uh, if Lebanon is 138th, what do countries that come after Lebanon look like? Now this extraordinarily high level of corruption gives rises to abuses and unethical behavior by businesses, such as the allegations of improper waste disposal detailed by the New York Times article to which I previously referred. Business and business ethics is about the day-to-day -day choices that managers make to behave ethically or unethically, whether or not they're constrained by government. But the lack of government constraint gives them more scope to behave unethically. The second reason why I think business ethics is different here is that the economic inequality and poverty in Lebanon makes many people, and especially the poor, vulnerable to mistreatment by businesses. Much of my own writing has focused on imbalances of power, particularly in business relationships with communities and employees. If someone lacks power in a relationship, he or she is at risk at, at exploitation as the more powerful party can choose how it wants to treat the less powerful party. Given that the unemployment rate in Lebanon is above 30% according to some estimates, with estimates of it going significantly higher in the next few months, and given that many people are working far fewer hours than they would like, there is a large group of people in Lebanon who are subject to the risk of being exploited by their employers. Flipping this around in a different context, it's well known that in the United States and in many other places, poor communities and communities of color suffer disproportionate environmental harms relative to race, rich and majority race communities. Imbalances of power and wealth therefore beget unethical behavior by business in the absence of some sort of government restraint, which again is often lacking, in particularly in a context like Lebanon. Finally, unethical business practices are life rife in Lebanon. Last semester, during my undergraduate business ethics class at the American University of Beirut, I read all sorts of, of examples of unethical behavior from my students' pa papers, but here I'm going to detail two. Early in the semester, students are assigned to a topic and have to interview two people about it. Many of my students took on the issue of child labor which according to a 2019 report by scholars at AUB is on the increase in Lebanon. I naively, as a Westerner, thought my students would interview people such as purchasing managers or consumers, but instead many of them interviewed child laborers. One of the very best papers compared and contrasted the experiences of a 15-year-old child worker with a 7-year-old child worker. Later in the semester, and this is the second example, students working on a training program for businesses on, on preventing bribery question why any business in Lebanon would take this sort of training seriously. In other countries, business bribery is a serious crime that leads to managers going to jail. The United States has the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the UK has the UK Bribery Act. In Lebanon, the very idea of anti-bribery training simply seemed absurd to my students. So again, while the topics are similar and many of the issues are similar, I would argue that there are significant differences in the Lebanese context that make talking about business ethics particularly uh, challenging, but also particularly important. I'd like to turn now to why I think theological ideas matter for work in business ethics. When talking about why theology has something to say about business ethics, 
I often use this quote by the philosopher Michael Walzer. We do not have to discover the moral world because we have always lived there. Indeed, it is through the world of theology that we do not discover the moral world because not only have we always lived there, we will continue to live there. Theology provides a deep a source of thinking about business ethics that is both old and new. It allows us to tap into the wisdom of thinkers within and across times, traditions, and contexts in order to cast new light on the dilemmas that we face today. All of the great theological traditions have had something important to say about the ethics of economic activity, including business ethics. Here I argue that religious ideas are useful for talking about business ethics in two significant ways. First, religious institutions and traditions have been and continue to be a source of practical wisdom beyond the truth claims they make to their members. Whether it is the Jewish Midrash tradition, thinking from Christian theologians and institutions, Islamic jurisprudence, or any number of other theological traditions, religion not only speaks to its members, but to the wider society as well. In this way, religion functions as a macro level social force that affects all the other institutions in society, including business. Second, it is useful for conversations about business ethics to tap into the deep thinking about the nature of justice from religious thinkers and sources. Of course, there's a lot of thinking from secular philosophy about the nature of justice that is incredibly useful. And as someone who has been influenced by philosophers such as John Walls, Chantal Mouffe, and Iris Marion Young, I would not want to set philosophy against theology. Rather, for all of you, I want to make a more basic claim. In thinking about the nature of justice and the place of business in creating a just and sustainable social order, Religious thinkers throughout the ages, as well as in the current day, have important things to say. Religion matters to how we think, and some of the best thinking about ethics and justice that is relevant to business ethics comes from religious thinkers and in institutions, both past and present. I will return later to what religious institutions can say about the present moment a little later in this lecture, but here I would note that there are important countervailing institutions that can do much to push back against unethical business practices while offer also offering a business a vision for what business could do to promote the common good. And to me, religion is one of those absolutely essential countervailing forces. In a society in which it has such high levels of injustice and inequality and such high levels of business unethical behavior, to me, what religion and religious institutions have to say is absolutely uh, vital. Now I want to turn to one specific religious idea that is highly useful in my own thinking for business ethics, namely the sin of greed. Now here are the seven deadly sins, and they're done in needlepoint. Now somehow they just seem a little less threatening in needlepoint. They seem almost cute when you put them uh, in that sort of way, but of course, the seven deadly sins have been the subject of a considerable amount of thinking. Of course, sin is an important theological concept. Sin represents a transgression against some definition or framework of divine law. Following Augustine, sin can occur in thought, word, or deed. Aquinas conceptualized sin as, quote, the turning away from the immutable good. The consequences of sin across religious traditions are relational, such as broken relationships among humans and between individual humans and, and God, as well as soteriological. As Williams notes in Drawing Upon Aquinas, quote, ethics or moral theology has to do with transforming persons so that they realize their potential and become their true selves. Here in the Christian tradition, for one example, One's true self is her saved and sanctified self, made possible through faith in Christ. Of course, concepts of sin and salvation are common to virtually all theological traditions. Sin, therefore, becomes a way of differentiating between the holy and the unholy, 
as well as between the sacred and the profane. Sin also represents how standards for a good life are established and communicated to members of a religious tradition. It should be noted, however, that sin can be both individual and collective. There is very little academic or theological work currently on the potential for sinful behavior by businesses or on applying the language of sin to business behavior. To me, this is all the more surprising because the social gospel of the 19th and 20th centuries in the United States did much to hold businesses to hold business account for the effects of their behaviors on the very poor, while also decrying the rising income inequality of the time. Further, and this is a point I'll come back to, religious institutions, whether we're thinking about groups such as Baptist, World Aid Australia, Christian Aid, the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, or the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, have had significant influence on the debate about business ethics. One key issue to think about is whether businesses as businesses can engage in sin or whether it is the human beings who work for them who are those who are sinful. I want to argue that the concept of sin can be applied to businesses as businesses, of course as well to the individuals who work for them, for three reasons. First, the concept of collective sin, say of countries treating the poor unjustly, is already present in a variety of theological traditions. By extension, if a country can engage in sin, so can a more focused collective such as business. Second, businesses such as corporations are treated as artificial persons, distinct from any one member of them. As a result, sin can be imputed to businesses as businesses, as well as to the members of those businesses who act in the business's name. And finally, and I think most vitally, businesses arguably have ethical obligations to create and to sustain organizational cultures that inhibit unethical and by extension sinful behavior by individual members. As the current Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, himself a former business person, put it during an interview about businesses and ethics before being elected as Archbishop of Canterbury, quote, I don't believe in good human beings, but I believe you can have structures that make it easier to make the right choice or the wrong choice. This picture by Hieronymus Bosch nicely illustrates the seven deadly sins from a Christian perspective. The sin of greed is located in the center circle. And I'll point to it up here. And so it is one, uh, it's one panel counterclockwise from the top. The panel, and I found this really uh, amusing, this was something uh, that uh, Donna uh, found, depicts a judge pretending to hear one side of a lawsuit fairly while simultaneously accepting a bribe from, bribe from the other side to decide the case in his favor. This may or may not depict actual events in Lebanon or other cases, I'm just throwing that uh, out there. But I think that depiction of sin and greed is really fundamental because I will talk about how sin represents a kind of misappropriation. In the Christian tradition, greed has been considered a grave sin since the time of Christ, who drew upon earlier Jewish tradition in his preaching and teaching. From the early apostles to Evadrius to Gregory the Great, who refined Evadrius's list of the deadly sins, to the medieval Franciscan monks, to Calvin and other reformers, greed has been among the most contemptible sins within Christian theology posing as it does a kind of idolatry amid the dangers of corruption and injustice. This is not to say that material possessions in and of themselves are morally problematic. In a paper about a normative core for, for stakeholder theory coming out of the Abrahamic uh, faith traditions, Ray et al. note that, quote, material goods in the three Abrahamic faith traditions were morally indifferent as long as they did not impede one's duty to God or to fellow humans. Rather, material possessions, among other forms of wealth, that have been gained because of greed are problematic because the underlying greed corrupts not only interpersonal relationships, but people's relationships with God. In this respect, greed is perceived to be a sin that disorders relationships among human beings, 
as well as moving the greedy individual away from what is of ultimate importance. While there are myriad sins that are relevant to business ethics within and across religious traditions, arguably greed is the most fundamental to understanding unethical behavior in business, and particularly in areas such as the employment relationship, which is one of my main areas of research. Discussions of greed, however, are hamstrung because in today's discourse, greed functions as a sanctioning label for bad behavior that lacks a clear definition. In this respect, however, ideas from theological analysis can be useful in bounding the concept of greed that makes it useful for business ethics. Aquinas offered one of the most important conceptualizations of greed for business ethics. A sin directly against one's neighbor, since one man cannot overabound in external riches without another man lacking them. And these are all points I'm going to come back to in a few minutes. Islamic theology offers a highly evocative and metaphorical definition of greed that addresses its impacts on others and the potential for dignitary harm. As noted by theologian Phyllis Tickle, quote, greed, according to the prophet, is having or desiring more than what is required of a man in order to keep his back straight. In this respect, the effects of greed are felt by others who are less than they could have been in the absence of it. The greedy behavior of one person not only affects the victim of greed materially, but also spiritually, as the victim's basic human dignity is violated and demeaned. As Wong and Murningham uh, put it, definitions of greed suggest the negative social consequences of greed focus primarily on the uneven distribution of resources. Understood in this way for discussions of business ethics, the victim uh, greed is a result of some sort of injustice that has led to someone being harmed because of the greedy behavior of another. Or put another way, the victim of greed has been not denied his or her, her due as a human being with others by the perpetrator of the greed. In theological terms, greed is also sinful because it causes people to place their trust in possessions rather than in God, and thus it distracts attention away from what is ultimately good and just and toward fleeting and narrow self-interest. In secular terms, greed allows some to have more than they need, and indeed more than they deserve, at the expense of others. It also leads to injustice in interpersonal relationships as well as structural injustice. So how does greed in business happen? I want to suggest that greed in business happens in three main ways. First, a business can externalize costs onto others and in so doing harm them and make them worse off. An externality in economic terms is a cost of production not paid for by the producer, but rather paid by someone else. In the Lebanese garbage example that I raised earlier, we all pay for the irresponsible behavior of refuse companies, not only directly through the misuse of our tax dollars, but also because the resulting pollution follows the water. There are other examples of business externalizing costs. For example, when Boeing sent out the 737 MAX with faulty systems, rather than fixing the plane, testing its systems, and training pilots properly, it was trying to externalize its product development costs onto innocent passengers in the airlines that bought its planes. Businesses that want to increase profits by reducing costs always, always will have an incentive to reduce those costs by externalizing them onto others. And when a business does that, it is behaving in a greedy manner. Sometimes, and this is my second point, businesses behave greedily by trying to extract wealth without consent or compensation. This can occur in a number of ways. A business can engage in fraud, seeking to take what doesn't belong to it by dishonest dealing. It can create a one-sided contract with a powerless stakeholder, such as a low-wage worker or a poor community. If the choice that someone has is between a bad deal or no deal at all, sometimes a bad deal is seen as the only viable option. <laughs> 
We can observe this in the ways that mining and other resource extraction companies deal with indigenous communities worldwide, or when a company takes advantage of high unemployment and low worker power to offer a take it or leave it employment relationship that leaves workers with no ability to negotiate better terms. In a related vein, business can also misappropriate the gains of their activities in ways that benefit top managers and shareholders at the expense of everyone else. Here I would note that in many countries, as I mentioned earlier, income inequality is rising and the share of national income going to capital is increasing relative to going to the share, the share going to labor, as can be seen in this slide. So in this, uh, this uh, slide, you see that the labor share of income in the United States was above 60% in the early 1970s, now down about 57% in similar levels for Australia and the OECD or other rich uh, countries. So capital is getting more and more national income and labor is getting less and less and less. When some people make contributions to a business's success that are not returned in the form of just compensation, which is the case for many communities and many workers, they are suffering from the ill effects of business greed. We see this in places such as the United States, where CEO compensation relative to the compensation of the average worker has increased dramatically since 1965. As the power of organized labor has declined in the United States, as has labor regulation, the ratio of average worker pay to CEO pay went from 20 to 1 in 1965 to more than 300 to 1 by 2017. That is not because CEOs are 20 times better now than they were in 1965. In the wealthiest nation in the world, we have seen not only massive increases in income inequality, but in many places, something we have never seen before in developed countries, reductions in life expectancy. The economist Angus Deaton and Ann Case have written about diseases of despair, such as drug overdoses, deaths from alcoholism, such as cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. This chart shows that diseases of despair among white middle-aged Americans with a high school degree or less that is, the very people who have fallen behind in economic terms as shareholders and CEOs have prospered has increased dramatically. And one wonders what a similar chart of Lebanon using data that's being generated right now would look like in a few years. Now, I'm very conscious of the fact that there has been a lot of depressing data in this lecture, and so I want to offer something to lighten the mood. Now that is an adorable kitten. So I put into Google, adorable kitten, and this was, I think, the number six picture, but to me, this is the most adorable kitten that I could come up with. <laughs> now that is the uh, mood lightener. I do want to offer some signs of hope and at least a, another more balanced perspective. I've said a lot about the effects of business uh, greed uh, and of sinful behavior and a lot about the unethical behavior of business, and that's really what I've dedicated my entire life to. But I also think that there have been improvements in business behavior. Businesses are starting to become more environmentally responsible. Multinational corporations are starting to take responsibility for factory conditions and human rights violations in their suppliers' factories, albeit incompletely. Some companies are relating more justly with the communities that host them. The story of business ethics, whether it's business ethics scholarship or practice or activism, is a story of incremental improvement. As civil society, stakeholders, and governments push businesses toward more responsible and ethical behavior to account for and pay their costs more fully and to share the gains of business activity more equitably. But this change is slow and indeed far too slow. In the protests and populist movements we see worldwide, including of course in Lebanon, we see not just frustration with government, 
but with an economy that is not delivering the kinds of opportunities that people want. In the massive in income inequality that we see in Lebanon, we can tell a story not just about government corruption in a business sector that has not brought about genuinely shared prosperity, but a lack of hope that people have that things will get better. So where do we go now, and what can the church say and do? <coughs> and somehow the slides got out of order. Okay, so uh, since I, so that slide did not make it onto uh, the, uh, on the screen, I want to talk about uh, three ways that religious institutions can contribute to uh, business ethics. And this is drawing from research that I've done with Jawad Syed and Razamir for a special issue of Business and Society on business as a macro level social force that can affect debates about uh, business uh, ethics. And so there are three roles that I want to focus on. The role of religion as advocate and prophet, the role of religion as prophet and issue entrepreneur, and the role of religion as convener and coalition builder. So all of these, I think, are relevant to the Lebanese context. First, let me talk about the role of religion as being an advocate and being a prophet. What does religion do best in the context of business ethics? I want to argue that religion functions most effectively when it brings attention to injustice, speaking on behalf of the powerless and exploited. So these are insights that we see from liberation theology, from the social gospel, from activism that focuses on topics uh, such as human trafficking. Religion at its very best calls attention to the fact that there is injustice in the world in that people who are powerless and exploited need some sort of fair treatment. But of course that's not enough in and of, it, it, of itself. In this context, I want to connect it to advocacy and prophecy related to business activity. And here I want to argue that there has been a lot of work that's been uh, done in, with regard to uh, religious institutions, whether in the United States or in Europe or in Asia or Australia, speaking truth to power in a very, very uh, fundamental way. And in so doing, I think there's a lot that religious do, can do to challenge the status quo when it comes to business uh, behavior. Now we can see an expression of this sort of role in last fall's declaration of the Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches in Lebanon. Uh, quote, as spiritual leaders, we have long warned the authorities about what is occurring today. However, this government and all of the successive governments for the last 30 years have continuously ignored our appeals and thus neglected their prime duties. Today, the, the people feel that their nation has been turned into small fiefdoms in which private interests and personal gains have the upper hand. They see that little consideration has been given to citizens' equality and rights. Instead, self-interest and self-gain have dominated political life at the expense of social welfare. This is why today, oppression has degenerated into an uprising. Now while this statement is a good start, and I would encourage everyone to read the full statement, I would argue that in the Lebanese context, there's more that churches and religious institutions can and should do to speak to the present moment, to speak not just to issues related to corruption, but also to what businesses have done to contribute to the climate of corruption, and ultimately what businesses can do to bring about a more just society in Lebanon. The second role that I think business, uh, that religion can and should play when it comes to business ethics is that of publicist and issue entrepreneur. <laughs> Simply put, there's a lot that religious institutions can do to call attention to human rights abuses, not just through statements, but through research. I worked for the Interfaith Center of Corporate Responsibility, which did a lot of work, not just in areas like the anti-apartheid movement involving South Africa, but in areas such as environmental justice, in business and human rights. 
With my students at AUB, I often use sections of a report written by Baptist World Aid Australia that details abuses in the apparel and the electronics uh, sectors. And indeed, one of the most important social movements in the United States was started by the United Church of Christ, and that was the movement for environmental justice. In 1983, the UCC published a report looking at where people were exposed to toxic waste. And the analysis is pretty simple. Look at where people are being exposed to pollution and toxic waste and overlay a map of race or ethnicity or income. And what you'll find is a very strong match. And what the United Church of Christ said is it's morally wrong for any of the people of God whether they're poor people or people who live in communities of color, to suffer environmental injustice. And in some sense, that particular report really began a whole social movement that made very, very significant changes to the ways that we think about the relationship between business and poor communities and communities of color. So the role that religious institutions can play in research in publicizing in a very public way, abuses by business, I think, is fundamental. And as a part of doing that, religious institutions function as issue entrepreneurs. They promote new issues and new ethical expectations that get placed on business. And in so doing, I think that religious institutions can do much to change the conversation about the appropriate place of business and what ethical behavior looks like in today's day and age. And the third role that I think business that religion can play is as a convener and a coalition builder. Simply by virtue of having buildings, but also having public legitimacy. So religious institutions in pretty much everywhere you can think have an enormous amount of social capital and an enormous amount of public legitimacy. And so they can bring people together in their buildings, they can bring them together uh, under the umbrella of what they do, and particularly if they work collaboratively across religious lines and sectarian lines, in order to promote uh, ideas related to uh, business ethics, but also to build coalitions. And I've been a part of a number of religious uh, groups, including the Interfaith Center of Corporate Responsibility, that did this very successfully that worked not just across Christian and Jewish and Muslim traditions, but with institutions that had no faith uh, calling or tradition at all. And in so doing, ICCR and other religious institutions have done a lot to build a coalition to press for changes in business behavior. Now, I would argue that the work of being a convener in a coalition builder should cut across religious and denominational lines I would also argue that there's a very strong role for seminaries, dioceses, and other collective bodies to help clergy and laity think about these issues much more theologically. And so all of these roles, I think, build upon the teaching and preaching mission of churches, but in so doing, they seek to make theology much more relevant to their context. I want to close by talking about what I think are three cat broad categories of principles for Christian institutions to advance, drawn on work in theology, which are useful in, uh, when we're trying to think about how we influence business behavior. And there's any number of them that I could have drawn on, but these are the three that make the most sense to me, not just in today's day and age, but particularly in the Lebanese context. The first principle that I think is important to advance is the notion of the common good, which comes from areas such as Catholic social uh, teaching. But really, I think of the common good in terms of how business creates genuinely shared prosperity for individuals, communities, and society. So how do we promote as religious institutions and as members of society uh, a vision for business in which business not only avoids greed, but business focuses on its core purpose beyond just making a profit. Don't get me wrong, I'm a creature of the business school. I think that profit is a good and noble and important thing. 
But profit is the result of a business behaving justly and accomplishing some purpose in society. When a business does something that is purposeful and useful, then that business merits and deserves some sort of profit. What we see in many places is the reverse, where business focuses on profit and then throws in purpose along the way. If we insist as religious people and thinkers and institutions that business promote a genuine sense of the common good, that is a significant contribution to the conversation about business ethics. A second contribution focuses on human dignity and human rights. To the witness that humanity is truly created in the image of God. For the last 10 years, I've been working in the area of business and human rights. We normally think of human rights as something that are the province of governments. So governments create the climate in which human rights are respected or not respected. But obviously, businesses can contribute directly or indirectly to human rights violations and in so doing, violate basic uh, human dignity. I think a theological perspective on business ethics insists on the dignity of every single human person, and in, as, as a result, that person has rights that are endowed to that person by God, that that person and those rights should not be violated in any way, shape, or form. And in this regard, I think that religious institutions have a really important story to tell. That a lot of the early work that was done on extending human rights obligations to businesses came out of work that was done by religious institutions. And the last is to think about business as a vocation and the vocation of business. To me, vocation is a very powerful theological term. And of course, every person has a vocation. It's not just people who are clergy people. So what would it mean to think of, and this will sound a little strange in this audience, what would, what would it think to think about banking as a kind of vocation? What would it mean to think about working as an accountant or working as a, a manager? I think there's much more that religious institutions can and should do to bring the idea of vocation not just as something that is a concept for clergy people, but as a concept for every single uh, person. But I also think that we want to talk about the vocation of business. <coughs> what is it that businesses ought to do? And to me, part of the vocation of business is to contribute to the common good by producing useful goods and services. To go back to the banking example, what would a vocation for banking look like? Imagine that you've got two groups of people in society. Group one has more money than good ideas. Group two has more good ideas than money. All the banking system should do is match those two groups of people. So when people with more good ideas than money can go to a bank and get a loan for those good ideas, that makes society better off. But when banks fund bad ideas, such as we saw in the 2008 financial crisis, when banks were funding really bad mortgages, banks not only fail to contribute to the common good, they fail to live up to their vocation and ultimately generate harm for society. So for me, thinking about the common good, about human dignity and human rights, and about business as a vocation and the vocation of business, these to me represent important theological ideas that religion and religious institutions can, tr can contribute to the debate about business and to the debate about business ethics. And so to conclude, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that Lebanon faces very, very significant challenges. And it's not really clear to me where the protest and the thawra goes up from here. I fear that Lebanon is in for a very, very rough decade, decade and a half, because there are very significant structural imbalances that have to be uh, dealt with, but also there's just a lot of work that has to be done in areas such as regulation and corporate social uh, responsibility. So it's gonna take Lebanon many, many years to get out of the situation that it's in, but I also think that there are real opportunities and there's a real possibility for uh, hope. However, it's important to note that the injustices that people in Lebanon are experiencing 
are not just brought about by government action, they're also brought about by business behavior and indeed by the intersection of business and government. And so me, for me, the fundamental question facing the church and facing religious institutions and indeed facing all of us is this. What can the church say now for the present moment to promote peace and justice in a truly just society with shared prosperity and how can we work toward that sort of society? And this is why I want to argue that the conversation about business ethics really needs to be fundamental to the conversation that we're having now about where Lebanese society needs to go. I'll stop here and throw it open for questions. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I, uh, I wonder, um, so even though in many parts of the world, there is also an intersection between the religious institutions and government and um, the Indeed there is. So they have actually skin in the game. Yeah. It's enormously uh, challenging, and it's one of the questions I've been uh, thinking about, realizing that I had only 45 minutes, and this was a 60-minute, 45-minute uh, lecture. That was one of the things I wanted to talk about, and so I'm really glad for the uh, question. My argument would be that religion functions best as a countervailing institution. So it's separate from government, it's separate uh, from a uh, business, but it really stands in a way that offers critique and judgment of other sectors of uh, society. The challenge, of course, for Lebanon is you have 18, 19 different religious uh, groupings, all of which have their own skin in the game, as you have put it, their own piece of the uh, pie. And as a result, I think it's very difficult to come up with some sort of conceptualization of the common good that cuts across uh, sectarian uh, lines. And this is a country of less than five million people, and yet you've got 18, 19 different uh, religious uh, groupings. First of all, that's just inefficient. But second, you can't really generate a conversation about the common good. And so what were the early protests about? They were about some sort of post-confessional, post-sectarian uh, future. I think for religion to play the kind of role that I'm proposing that it could and should play, religion is going to have to function uh, differently. And so the relationship between religious uh, bodies and the estate is going to have to change, uh, 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 it would have to change fundamentally. Now that may seem like a naive hope, but I also think it, it would be similarly naive to think that Lebanon can go on as it has without anything uh, changing and things ultimately uh, getting uh, better. Uh, I also think that this, and I don't underestimate, underestimate this at all, is gonna pose some very, very significant challenges for interreligious uh, dialogue. And I think there is some really important work to be done in terms of bringing people across different religious uh, traditions together to start to have a conversation about what would a common good for the Lebanon for Lebanon look like, and what is our place in promoting that? Yes. Yes. The problem of uh, how and when the church will uh, step in uh, is debatable because uh, of the different roles of uh, communities yeah. here. Indeed. But why can academia really step in, and why? Do you think academia is still not addressing the ethical issue right. forcefully? Mm -hmm. we, we have a new president at the UB yeah. who for the first time came in and visited other academic professionals yeah. trying to lobby academia to really not address only ethics in yeah. business, but ethics in politics maybe, or ethics in public sector. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, during your period, yeah. have you witnessed this developing? And yeah. And a lot of it has developed, uh, unfortunately, negatively yeah. for AUB. Yeah. How can this better develop more proactively across uh, academia mm. and bring a more powerful public-private partnership right. to, to address this issue forcefully and benevolently? 
It's an excellent question, and I think it gets to one of the fundamental issues that all everyone who's an academic uh, faces, which is how do we get beyond speaking to people in our own narrow fields and to engage in more public scholarship and public uh, witness? I was actually having a conversation earlier today with one of my friends in Australia, and he and I were uh, talking about this in the context of the wildfires in Australia, which consumed millions of acres and killed hundreds of millions of animals. And so we talked about, well, what is the role of business schools in addressing the climate crisis and how do business schools work with other academics to try to develop ways of talking and tools in order to have an effect on the uh, debate about things like the climate crisis. So you ask a very good uh, question. Uh, there's a couple of things I think I would say in response. The first is that academics aren't terribly good at that. Uh, they're very good at talking to people in their own uh, fields. And so I think this is an area where academics need uh, help uh, one of my uh, friends has put on media training for academics, so bringing together newspaper reporters and academics, and those have been incredibly useful sessions. But I think the other thing is that academics have tended to think of themselves as standing apart from what it is that they're studying, so maintaining some sort of a critical uh, distance. And to me, that's really uh, problematic. Uh, I've argued in some of my own uh, writing that when it comes to issues such as employment, academics ought to take a side, and they ought to explicitly take a, a side uh, that is in favor of, for example, worker interests. So I think part of the problem is that there are well ingrained attitudes and behaviors, and to be perfectly honest, incentive structures, because you don't get tenure on the basis of your uh, public uh, profile, you get tenure on the basis of writing articles for the other 10 experts in your field. And that's going to require just a very different way of academics thinking about their uh, role. But the comments that I made about academics or uh, religions working together across religious lines and sectarian lines, I think are equally applicable to academics. And what I would hope is that Lebanon could be a test case for how to do this successfully. So for example, how do we bring together theologians and business uh, of people and members of civil society, all of whom have an interest in the common good, together to try to figure out where Lebanon uh, might usefully go from here. Mm -hmm. And the dominant trends in politics and business in the world is very capitalistic. Right. And, and nowadays, you have, I mean, in Arabic, you say about salary, you say ma'ash, which means livelihood. Mm -hmm. Now you have people who earn $35 million for a mm -hmm. role in a movie or playing football, mm -hmm. which is really crazy. Yeah. Because, I mean, what can you do with all this money if, if you need money to, to live? Yeah. Mm -hmm. are against socialism, mm -hmm. although religion is socialist. Right. Mm -hmm. As a religious man or a right. religion and religion, mm -hmm. would you fight this kind of salaries or this? Right. Thing? It's a really interesting uh, question because on the one hand, it's easier to figure out if a football player had a better year than a CEO. Uh, you can count the number of goals and assists and things like that, whereas with a CEO, Maybe the CEO had a good year. Maybe the CEO didn't have a, a good year. In a more serious uh, vein, I, I think you ask a really uh, provocative uh, question. And I would answer it in a couple of uh, different ways. One is there are models of capitalism that are better or worse when it comes to promoting social justice. So I talk a lot about uh, social democracy. So uh, a very strong uh, state with relatively high levels of taxation that are progressive. And if you look at these uh, societies, uh, places like Germany and Scandinavia, they combine very, very competitive economies. Nobody can say that Sweden or Norway or Germany don't have competitive economies. Uh, 
relative to the rest of the world, but they combine that with strong social protections, uh, strong regulation, and strong workplace of protections. Maybe the way that I would think about this is with a concept that I often talk about with my students, which is the difference between a high road equilibrium and a low road equilibrium. So a high road equilibrium would be something like social democracy where you have strong protections, uh, people can get rich, but they face high levels of taxation, but they're still doing just fine. As you properly uh, point out, you've got uh, strong public investments and investments in infrastructure. And the thing about that is that's an equilibrium. And those societies tend to sustain themselves for the long haul. But you can also have a low road equilibrium, which I fear that you know, Lebanon is uh, stuck in, where you have low wages, low regulation, low workplace uh, uh, protections. And the problem is that's an equilibrium too, and that's really difficult to get out of. So I think the fundamental challenge for those of us in uh, churches is to think about models of capitalism that ultimately work together uh, for the, uh, for the uh, common uh, good uh, because for better or for worse, I think that's where we are right now. And when you have an economy like China, which is nominally communist or Marxist, but obviously has an enormous number of uh, businesses, it's, uh, and by the way, very high levels of income inequality, it's really hard to say that that's also not a capitalist society. It's a capitalist society with high levels of state control. This is where I think religion has to speak truth to power and offer a vision for what economics in business could look like in a way that generates genuinely shared prosperity, bearing in mind that there are gonna be different models that make sense given different countries' histories and values. I knew and who were related to me over a funeral situation. And I said, um, how do I go about finding an apartment here that I can afford? Um, because I'm not coming in with great riches, but I'm here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer was, oh, there are plenty of apartments. And people are building apartments all the time to absorb the refugees coming in from Syria. Yeah. I said, well, then, can I rent one? Oh, he said, no, they'd rather leave them empty than, than rent to you. Mm -hmm. I found that a very interesting answer. He said, but you probably do better up in Alaya or in the mountains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the other thing I asked him was, you know, what are the rules and regulations if you want to say, build an apartment building? Oh, he said, the rules here is, I want. All you have to mm -hmm. know is, I want. Mm -hmm. You see, you have a building, you want to put a third story, you put it on. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, if they say anything, well, never mind. It's what I want. Yeah. So when you have basic society, and I'm talking about people yeah. with my intelligence level, yeah. which is, you know, kind of middle, um, thinking that way, right. having been brought up that way, living within a social context yeah. Yeah. that has always operated that way, you really have to start at the bottom and yeah. work up to the mm -hmm. I think you make a very good uh, point. So I'm a big fan of a podcast called the Lebanese Politics Podcast, and there's been a lot of discussion of the financial sector, and I was introduced to a new idea. So you've all heard of WASTA, but what about Super WASTA? Basically, Super WASTA is the way that anything ultimately uh, gets uh, done in the banking sector. So just having a lot of money or having a political connection, regular WASTA isn't enough. Now you need super wasa if you want to have anything done. And this gets to, I think, a more fundamental problem, which is in the same way that organizational cultures are sticky and difficult to change, so are national uh, cultures. So let me go back to the story of my students doing the training on bribery prevention and then saying, and I think to their credit, you know, very honestly with me, nobody is going to take this uh, seriously. Uh, the challenge is how do you get to a point where people take that seriously? And so we all know that obviously ethical culture makes a difference and culture makes a difference. How do you change a, a culture? Well, anthropologists have been working on this for you know, many, many years and have no, uh, no real idea. To the extent that it's even remotely possible, 
However, I do think that religious institutions are going to have to start to take the lead and to start to have conversation about what kind of social contract should Lebanon have in the future or what kind of, uh, of, of regulation. So think about the buildings on the Corniche, for example. In pretty much everywhere else, uh, the buildings right on the uh, water are lower, and then you build up as you go up into the hills. But of course, because of WASTA, uh, we've got buildings right on the water that are super high that are blocking everybody else's view. In a country with zoning regulation, or indeed any building regulation at all, you would have a very different situation. So until you take something like that, and can fix that and figure out how to fix that from the standpoint of culture, it's difficult to figure out the way forward. And again, this is where I just remain very strongly convinced that to the extent that there's any hope at all, it's going to have to be religious institutions fostering those sorts of conversations. Yeah. The public sector. <clears throat> but uh, in this country, this has always existed mm -hmm. uh, uh, in one way or another. Right. But we have somehow, during a, a period of uh, post war trauma, lost some of the yeah. mm -hmm. components of this uh, yeah. issue in the 1990s. Uh, other societies have done uh, something very similar. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, maybe sometimes an intervention of local as well as regional and international yeah. uh, groups that restructured uh, uh, maybe uh, Japan yeah. through a, a plan that uh, institutionalized a lot of reforms and yeah. quality related mm -hmm. reforms. Do, do you see this happening here? Is it something that ethically could be presented or mm -hmm. is it something that politicians do from outside. Right. Are there inherent mm -hmm. capacities in this uh, community uh, that can do mm -hmm. that, that can open the dialogue and address it uh, a little bit more transparently with the public sector? Right. I think the fundamental issue I wish I had a happier question to go out on because that would have been you know, that would have been and then we could have gone out for a coffee uh, afterwards. The Fundamental problem, I think, is Lebanon is an extraordinarily low trust society, where trust is located in uh, family or one's uh, religious unit uh, uh, area or uh, in one's uh, community. And one of the things that we know that makes not just society effective but business effective is what's called generalized trust. So the sense that I trust you because we're part of the same body and I don't know you, but you're a member of a organization that I trust and we're part of a society that has a high level of trust. And so societies with a high level of generalized trust tend to do better than societies in which trust is based on face-to-face -face relationships or kinship relationships or religious uh, uh, co-membership. The challenge, I think, and this is true whether we're talking about institutions within Lebanon or institutions outside of the country that would provide some sort of assistance is, how do you build trust in a society in which generalized trust is largely uh, absent? And I wish I had a better answer to that question, but the reality is I don't. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming.